Uh, I'm delighted to introduce um, the first speaker of the afternoon, um, Dr. David Schiedemeyer. Um, David and I have known each other a long time. Uh, he was in uh, not the first, but the second fellowship class, um, the great class of 1987. Uh, there, how, how many were in that class, David? Four, four. Um, David is a palliative care physician at the Theta Clark Medical Center and a community associate of the Medical Humanities Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. David has an interest in the medical care of the underserved and part of his medical training occurred in Liberia um, at the Elwa Hospital. He completed a sabbatical during training at Tuba City Hospital on the Western Navajo Reservation in Arizona. David's clinical interest is in the long-term management of diabetes and hypertension and in teaching ambulatory medicine and clinical ethics. Um, among David's uh, many books, uh, I'll, I'll just mention a few. Um, he and John LaPuma wrote a book in 1994 called Ethics Consultation, A Practical Guide, um, which was a landmark book uh, at its time. Um, another book uh, that David has co-authored with Carl Junkerman and with Art Dursey, I think Art is in the audience there, Art, um, is called Practical Ethics for Medical Students, Interns, and Residents, now in its third edition, and I understand that a fourth edition is being planned. Um, another, another poetry case book that David wrote is called House, Call, House Calls, Rounds, and Healing. So it's a great pleasure of mine uh, to bring David Schiedemeyer back uh, to the, to the uh, center to speak about going home again. David. Well, thanks so much, Mark, and thanks for giving me a chance as a young man all those years ago. You know, uh, people uh, ask me if I ever play my accordion for dying patients. And I say, that would just be mean. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're too sick to get away. <laughs> so I, I've just been waiting for someone to ask me, and so far no one has. Uh, actually, I was asked once to play at the wedding of a dying man's son at, at our hospice, and in the rehearsal, just a few minutes before the service, the minister asked if I could play Here Comes the Bride. And I don't know the last time that you've heard that song, but I hadn't heard it since cartoons as a kid. But this was my big chance, so I said, I'll do it. And wouldn't you know, the first part of that song is just made for the old button box. You just toggle a few buttons here and there. <laughs> Luckily, the chapel's really tiny, and that's the only part I had to play. That's the easy first part. <laughs> Before you knew it, the handsome groom and his bride were up front. So no, I don't usually play the accordion out loud at the hospice. But on that day, a family member of another patient in a nearby room said, I heard that accordion. It reminded me of my uncle playing years ago. And I said, that's why I play it. It reminds me of home, too.
So, yes, in a way, I, I'm always somehow playing the accordion for my patients. It reminds me to help them get back home to the Shire. Here's another story. An 80-year-old farmer with 200 acres of barley is dying of COPD and CHF and renal failure, and you know how they all circle around again. And despite the morphine drip, he's quite lucid. He says it's harvest time and the winter's coming and his son is out on the tractor and he wants to be out there too, but he's just too sick. So I get up to leave and I tell him I'll see him in the morning, but he says, no, you won't. I'll see you upstairs, Doc. He dies that night. There's another patient with lung cancer, and he's been in terminal delirium, and that's what we call it medically, but it really is just kind of a, a middle space. And three times he's called out to that middle space in front of him, he said, I'm ready, I'm going. But today when I see him, he's yelling, I changed my mind. His family's troubled by this apparent change of heart, but I tell him it's okay, it's, it's natural. I'm reminded though of a, another patient who earnestly pulls on my sleeve asking me, Doc, I'm dead now, aren't I? Am I, am I dead now? I'm somehow reminded of the, of the old song. You know, there, there are shared elements. And shared elements in all of these cases, as different as they may seem, the patient is really thinking, Doc, give me the truth. Am I dying? I'm close. Am I home yet? You know, home is a place of familiar sounds and sights and smells. Home is a place you wish for, a place like Evelyn's Kitchen in this uh, Tom Waits song. I walked from Natchez to Hushpakina. I built a fire by the side of the road. I lived on nothing but dreams and train smoke. Somehow my watch and chain got lost. I wish I was home in Evelyn's kitchen with old Jif curled around my feet. And I hope my pony, I, I hope my pony, I, I hope my pony knows the way back home.
You know, some people just aren't willing to trust their ponies to know the way back home. One of my patients is a meticulous, highly organized, successful woman who wants to prepare accordingly for the afterlife. But she's dying with spiritual distress. Our chaplain visits her daily because she has so many questions and concerns about near-death experiences, lights at the ends of tunnels, her own faith tradition's view of the afterlife. But like me, our, our chaplain can only listen. Like me, he has no real answers to these questions. Like me, he has seen too many people die, the good and the bad, with or without the peaceful look on their faces, with or without their eyes open, with or without religion, with or without family members at their sides, with or without. And like me, he can't answer the one question she's really asking us. What do I do early in the morning, on the day, the next day after I die? Next day, you know, she'll be up working early in the morning, and the first thing on the agenda is a good cup of coffee as thick and black as bilge water. One of the many troubles with dying is that no one can tell you from personal experience what to bring, what to leave behind. No one can pack for you on this trip. Perhaps it's because home is not just a, a familiar place of peace and safety and contentment, a place like Evelyn's Kitchen. It's also a place of longing. It's a place where we've never been, but we always want to go. For me, this place is, is hard to describe without music. I listen to my words, but they fall far below. I let my music take me where my heart wants to go. I sat upon the setting sun. I never wanted water once. No, never, never, never. Speaking of water, it's another rainy night at the hospice. I'm at the bedside of a man dying of prostate cancer. He has that kind of hormone unresponsive prostate cancer that uh, is just riddled with metastases. Even his skull is, is riddled with the tumor. His son is a burly bearded Harley type and he tells me he went out to the crossroads at the cemetery the night before. He went and stood over his mother's grave and he said, Mom, time, come and get dad, come and get him. He thinks his dad's taking too long to die. He wants him to have more medicine. But I'm like the old bartender down at the Crossroads Bar. I know the man's had enough to drink already. He has several of the physical signs of dying. He's got no pulse, although I can hear his heartbeat with my stethoscope. He has no urine output. Remarkably, although he's moving his jaw while breathing, and ordinarily should be gurgling and gasping for breath, he's breathing quite slowly and peacefully. That's because I've given him the equivalent of a couple of drinks for the road. So I tell his son, he's already on his way. He's going now to be with your mom. Just stay with him. No need to speed this up, I think to myself. He's okay. He's going home tonight. When a man loves a woman, He'd sleep out in the rain if she says that's the way it ought to be.
Now, in terms of taking things with you when you die, you could really do worse than my uncle Jarvie. Like me, he played the harmonica and the accordion. And when he died, we put a harmonica in his coffin. I do think this is the proper burial practice for harmonica and accordion players. And I think it could even apply to bagpipers. You know, if you're Scottish and you die outside of Scotland, after you're underground, the sprites come and they transport you through the secret passages right back home to Scotland. So that's how in this old song, the dead man's able to get back home again. His living companion takes the high road, but he takes that low underground road. By yon bonny banks and by yon bonny braes, where the sun shines bright on Loch Lomond, there me and my true love spent many happy days on the bonny bonny banks of Loch Lomond. You know, that is a little bit like a bagpipe, isn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be a better world if we put all the harmonicas and the accordions and the bagpipes right in the coffins and the urns of those who played them in this life? It would take them completely out of circulation. It's really quite risky allowing them to go to estate sales or antique shops. Someone might restore them. Did you realize that the fragile reeds inside here are only held on by beeswax? They are just waiting to go out of tune. I'd say don't let sick accordions even make it to the box patrol. I'd say make them DNR, do not repair. Don't you think? Ah, but that's not my worry. That's a problem for the next generation. And speaking of the next generation, let's get back to the things that we leave behind and the things that we carry. We leave memoirs and memories. We leave songs. We leave home and family. And most of all, we leave behind the next generations to do as they will. What do we take with us? Well, I'm not telling you what to pack, but I know of the things that I'm going to carry. I'm with my Uncle Jarvie. I, I'm going to take my harmonica. Uh, I'm going to take my accordion. You know, these bellows are just made out of cardboard. The casings on both sides, which hold the reeds, are just thin wood. The reeds are milli millimeters thick strips of metal. Buttons are just plastic. The whole thing should cremate nicely. I mean, who among us is to say that there are not button boxes there when I go home again? And I'll be sitting around the kitchen table playing the accordion while the family talks. And although they're too kind to say anything, I can tell that I'm bothering them in a way that only harmonicas and accordions and bagpipes can bother people. <laughs> Even people who love you. So I'll go to the back bedroom. And only my old beagle Shiloh will go with me there, curled up in his bed with his feet under his chin and his eyes half open, just waiting for me to play the next song. Just like home. Thank you. Uh, it's time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. 
I, thank you. I, I think I have time for questions uh, about accordions or harmonicas or uh, going, going home again. And while we're waiting for those, don't forget that tonight, guitar man John Lantos will be there uh, leading a sing-along along with uh, our lead singer, Mark the Legend <laughs> Siegler, singing I Shall Be Released by Bob Dylan. <laughs> so any, any questions at all? I, this one is about uh, almost 100 years old, and this is about 70 they can be repaired. Yes. That better? Hey. Um, so my name is Una Bernhardt. I'm a master's student at the Harris School here. Um, there's been a lot of research recently about uh, music at the end of life, working for Alzheimer's patients and patients with other severe um, cognitive disabilities at the end of life. Um, how has your experience, have, have you had any experience with that, and could you share a little bit? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if you remember the old movie, The Doctor with uh, William Hurt. The key thing is to play the music the patient wants, so, I, I mean, that is no small point. The memory should be the patient's. John LaPuma is going to give a talk on uh, comfort food, and, uh, and we're... Music is like comfort, you know, those songs that you knew when you were 15 are kind of imprinted on you. So, uh, it, so I think people, I always encourage people to, if someone has their, made music in, during their life, sometimes they even have their own CD. Um, uh, they, they at least bring the CD that the patient's made so he, can, he or she can hear their own music. And it's amazing, sometimes I come in and they say, mom was a great piano player, she even played you know, for the choir or something, and I go, well, it, does she have any tapes of her music? And they go, oh, yeah, we have them somewhere. So I so said, let's bring them in. Um, very individual. What do you think? Do you think we should be playing music at the bedside more? I know that it worked for my family. Um, so, yeah, from, from time to time, I think it can work. I think it can work, too. We don't want to crowd them. I wasn't kidding about, you know, I don't walk in with the accordion and say, how would you like to hear when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, you know? <laughs> Some people like harp music and a little higher class music than, than and that they deserve that classical music if that's their thing. Everyone has different music, you know, um, but it's a great question. I mean, the question is what, what, what music to play. It's like a prescription for the patient. Um, when we all get to nursing homes, you'll want to be, you'll hear Van Morrison in the dining room instead of Good Night Irene. Th that was so beautiful, thank you. Oh, thank you. I don't think I'll ever forget that. Um, you know, one of, what I thought you did so beautifully was bring dignity and actually, um, um, a sense of possibility on the subject of dying, which I think is just very, very unique. And one of the um, concerns I have is there's, there's just tremendous unfairness in the differences in the way people have the opportunity to die or the dignity with which people die across strata, especially socioeconomic and I think racial lines in our country. And I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. That's a great question and I appreciated your work uh, in the community. At, uh, well, I mean, um, I don't know my thoughts on that. And yeah, you know, I don't, that's a great question. I mean, everybody dies kind of one at a time. I do know there's people dying now that have never died before. <laughs> but to dignify the, such a great question is so hard because uh, I think that dying services should be on your list of they're on your community list, and, and uh, let me just say, you know, people that, uh, people without financial means surely are, uh, are not without spiritual means. So I don't know that, you, that we, dying is no respecter of 
the pocketbook. How's that? Persons. Everyone goes so. I think a lot of, but I think it could be on the resource list. How's that? Dying services, hospice services. We don't, you know, I, I take it that it's a, it's a deeper question than just dying in pain. I mean, I think we're doing a pretty good job uh, of not having people die in pain anymore, physical pain. But this spiritual pain is a really tough question because our chaplain will say, at our meetings, will say, well, what's the, what's the patient's spirituality? And he'll say, they go to such and such. And then we'll say, well, have they been, has such and such been there to visit? And oh yeah, they came one time. So he's going like every day, some of, these, some of these patients. I mean, she really wanted to know what to get ready. She always gets ready for stuff. So it's not enough to just say to her, you're good, you're good. <laughs> It'll be fine. She really wanted to know. So he was there every day. So those, I mean, those are kind of resources that, again, people without means are not without those resources either. And those, we may not be able to monitor those. That's what I'm trying to say. Very good question. Well, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I thank you for that comment. So I think everyone heard that the, the musical voice of your loved one, that's probably the best music you could hope that you'd have that when you go, when you go home again. So I'm, it still says yellow, so that's good, right? Come, come on up. Let's... We've got to get this, keep this show rolling.